and action. <laughs> we were all just saying it feels like we're backstage about to go on, and we're so thrilled you joined us today. Welcome back. I feel like we should have a theme song or something. <laughs> we're so thrilled you joined us. Welcome back to the PRH Morning Buzz. That's also the hashtag, hashtag PRH Morning Buzz. So say hello. Let us know where you're listening from or watching from. Um, I'm Jen Rubens. I'm clapping in from, from Brooklyn. And um, we're just so thrilled you're here. So welcome. And as we kick things off, we'll quickly introduce ourselves, even though I know many of you know who we are, we hope, but um, if we go to the next slide, we'll formally introduce ourselves. I'm Jennifer Rubin. Hi, everybody. Oh, I'm Elizabeth Fabian. So good to see you guys again. <laughs> and good morning, everyone. I'm Miriam Tulio, uh, calling in from Queens, New York. Good to Hello. see you. And it's good to see you guys, too. We haven't done this in a little while, so we're so thrilled you've come back. We've missed you. And so we wanted to kick it off um, with a very simple question just to remind ourselves or to check in. So on the next slide, we have our reminder, PRH Morning Buzz. But we want to know from you, what are you loving right now? Are you reading something that you're completely in love with? Are you listening to something you love? Are you watching something? Are you cooking? Um, are you guys in particular loving anything right now? <laughs> Like go either way, but um, I, I can jump in. I I yeah. like so many other people am reading Naomi Novik's A Deadly Education, which is so oh. amazing. Um, I mean the world building she does, the character building is incredible. I mean it really, really is. And I'm I'm not clearly the first person to say this, but if you haven't picked it up, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so that's wonderful. And I'm watching. I haven't finished it because of little kids, so I can't finish a movie in one sitting, but I'm watching The Social Dilemma, which is, like, really interesting and terrifying at the same time. So um, those are the two things that I'm a little bit obsessed with right now. That's on my list. I'm afraid to watch, but I've heard it's fantastic and necessary viewing, so I'm going to add that to my list. I don't think my three-year-old would be interested. So. Probably not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Miriam, what are you loving right now? I'm um, reading uh, two books that I am really enjoying and um, finding a lot of inspiration from. One is a memoir by Paula Ramos, uh, Finding Latinx. Um, and she's a seasoned journalist who is exploring her identity as a, a queer Cuban, Mexican, first generation American. And she takes a road trip and interviews um, different uh, Latinx folks trying to figure out like where they stand politically, socially, uh, culturally, their sense of identity. Um, also, I'm reading um, by Mitchell Resnick, who's the, a professor at um, in MIT Media Labs, lifelong kindergarten, um, and he's exploring creative learning um, through the use of innovative technologies and oh, wow. yeah this is pre-covid so i'm really curious to see also what his perspective on innovation and creativity is sort of in the in the digital world at this time that is very interesting both of those well thanks for sharing that um i joke to you guys i said i started this is so unlike me i started reading and watching concurrently the home edit thinking you know i've been home a lot <laughs> Maybe I should fix some things, which is very, if anyone's seen my cubicle at the office, they're like, oh, you should definitely watch this show. But um, it's it's really, I feel like I could maybe accomplish these things, but I have not labeled or organized yet. But I'm maybe building up my, my inspiration to eventually <laughs> try it. But, um, but it's great because it's an audio, so you could listen while you clean, and then you could read the book, or the ebook has beautiful pictures, and then the show has you know, very aspirational celebrity homes where you're like, maybe I could do that one day. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, well, thanks for sharing. And thanks to all of you for sharing. We can't wait to check out the hashtag and see what you are loving right now. And just to jump ahead, I think you all know this, but we love to remind you about all of the many formats that are available in all of our book picks that we're going to talk about. So um, you can see them on the screen there from HD hardcover to trade paperback large print, ebook, e-galley, which I think is the most fun one to take a, to take note of. So you can know if you can request it on NetGalley or Edelweiss. And then of course from audio, DN means audio download and CD means compact disc. 
So um, before we get into, we have so many books to introduce, lots of fun categories, lots of fun events. Um, we did want to introduce you to um, a little known author who was just announced as, as releasing a very big book coming out on November 17th. I personally couldn't be more thrilled. Um, uh, Barack Obama has announced A Promised Land. It comes November 17th. We don't have it on the screen, but this will be available in all formats, from hardcover to CD to um, to download to large print. And this is the first volume, the highly anticipated first volume of his presidential memoirs, of course, and he tells the story of his odyssey from a young man searching for, him, for his identity to leader of the free world. So it's really a reflection on the presidency, but it also takes readers on the journey from his earliest political aspirations to the incredible night of November 4th, 2008, when he was elected the 44th president of the United States. And um, he has already recorded the audiobook. I was very excited to hear um, that. And I've been listening to Michelle Obama's podcast over the summer. So that's been, it was so wonderful to hear them in conversation. It feels so candid. And um, I'm very excited to, to dive into learning a little bit more about his fascinating life. So we hope that you are too. And the cover, I think it's so stunning when they launched it for yeah. us too. They showed us the back cover, which I'm sure they'll reveal soon to the world. But it is, it's just a beautiful, beautiful photos of, of him and um, really exciting. <laughs> Uh, we also wanted to share the news that Penguin Random House recently launched The Conversation, uh, a new website that highlights books and multimedia resources that aim to raise our collective consciousness about bias and race. Um, it's also aimed to help us spark discussions across communities, classrooms, book clubs, and workplaces. Uh, the featured materials include recommended and inspiring reads for parents and teens, uh, teaching guides for educators, tools for community activists, and a wide range of multimedia resources for religious groups, volunteer organizations, neighborhood associations, and other groups that are seeking to affect change. Uh, we encourage you to check out the conversation by visiting the URL on this slide. And as always, PRH authors are appearing everywhere virtually this week. Um, we have Phil Clay, the author of Redeployment and his debut novel, Missionaries. He's in conversation with Marlon James, hosted by Bookstore Magic tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then the iconic Patti Smith is appearing as part of the Bay Area Book Festival tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, and as part of the new One World Ideas in Action series, uh, Reva Lehrer, she's an, the artist and author of Gollum Girl, and Molly Crabapple, the illustrator of Brothers of the Gun, they're going to discuss um, art as resistance, and that's coming up on October 15th. So these are just a few of the amazing events that are happening. Um, if you want to learn more, you can um, visit the URL on the screen, prh.com backslash books, connect us live to find out more, and you can always watch archives of any events you may have missed. Thank goodness. There's so many things <laughs> to take in. I'm so glad we can go back and Absolutely. enjoy them all. And just a reminder, um, Library Journal will once again be hosting their Library Con Live event. Um, the date is November 5th. We'll be participating. We're so thrilled to share with you lots of uh, materials and book recommendations we have from graphic novels to science fiction to fantasy to gaming. Um, and we have a number of authors who are already confirmed to be appearing, including Josh Mallerman, um, Joe Hill, Jeff Lemire, and more. And I'm um, sure to be adding more as things come, come up. So as we get closer. Um, so please, if you haven't already registered, the event is free. Again, it's on November 5th and hosted by Library Journal. So our first category is here. I felt pressure for props today. Here's my <laughs> magical fairy tale pumpkin <laughs> as we go into a magical world of reading. <laughs> I will. Well, as you guys can probably guess from me gushing over Naomi Novik, I love a fairy tale reimagined or turned on its head. I mean, I remember the first time I saw Into the Woods, I was like completely spellbound. Um, and I think Catherine Arden is spectacular, too. So um, it will come as no surprise that I'm really excited to take you into the deep, dark woods in a far-off country many, many years ago. I'm so, so tempted to sing Santa right now. <laughs> <laughs> so are you ready? Is everyone ready? Okay, here we go. Um, Enter the Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornicek. Um, Anger Boda's story begins where most wishes' stories ends with a burning 
It's a punishment from Odin for refusing to provide him with knowledge of the future. The fire leaves her injured and powerless, and she flees into the farthest reaches of a remote forest. And there she's found by a man who reveals himself to be Loki. She's initially distrustful of him, but then that transforms into a deep and abiding love. But this romance with the legendary trickster awakens the wrath of the gods. This is a moving and subversive um, debut that reimagines Norse mythology. It's a story of love and loss and hope, and it's perfect for fans of Madeline Miller's Circe and Neil Gaiman's North mythology, Norse mythology. Um, and next is The Swallowed Man. Uh, ingenious storyteller Edward Carey returns to reimagine a time-honored fable, the story of an impatient father, a rebellious son, and a watery path to forgiveness for the young man known as, have you guessed it? If you guessed Pinocchio, you're right. Um, <laughs> reaching back into the original 19th century Italian children's book, Carrie oh finds God. new depths for the characters. <laughs> well done. Thank and you. a parable that will um, have new resonance for contemporary readers. Uh, the book is full of charm and atmosphere and emotional depth and, of course, features Carrie's trademark fantastical illustrations. It's a parable about parenthood and loss and letting go, um, and his creative mind is clearly on par with the likes of Gregory Maguire and Neil Gaiman and Tim Burton. Uh, next is a tale for fans of Ursula Le Guin and Karen Joy Fowler and the HBO show His Dark Materials. From the award-winning author of M. M. Taka, I'm sure I said that wrong, <laughs> comes The Memory Theater, a fantastical tour de force about friendship interdimensional theater and a magical place where no one ages well except for the young um, in a world just parallel to ours there exists a magical realm known as the gardens it's a place where feasts never end games of croquet have devastating consequences and teenagers are punished for growing up for a select group the masters it's a decadent paradise where time stands still but for those who serve them it's a slow torture where their lives can end in a blink in a bid to escape this, Dora and Thistle, best friends and confidants, set on a remarkable journey through time and space, traveling between their world and ours as they hunt for a person who can grant them freedom. This is endlessly inventive, and the memory theater takes the reader into a wondrous place where destiny has yet to be written, life is performance, and magic can erupt at any moment. Oops. For those of you who are interested in a timely and feminist debut, look no further than Heather Walter's Malice. Some of you may have had the opportunity to hear Heather speak at the recent LJ uh, Day of Dialogue, and if you did, you know that Heather has always been drawn to the villains in fairy tales. She doesn't accept their words and deeds at face value. She always wants to delve deeper into what made them who they are. So Malice is a darkly magical retelling of Sleeping Beauty, and true love is more than a simple fairy tale. A princess isn't supposed to fall in love with an evil sorceress, but that's exactly what Alice and Aurora do. This is perfect reading for fans of Naomi Novik's Spinning Silver, Catherine Arden's The Bear and the Nightingale, and Sylvia Moreno-Garcia's Gods of Jade and Shadow, and definitely has YA crossover appeal. And the author is a librarian herself, so really, how could this get any better? <laughs> Um, and next is The Charmed Wife, which your pumpkin will come in handy for. Um, it's a sophisticated uh, literary fairy tale for fans of Madeline Miller, Karen Russell, Kelly Link, and Diane Setterfeld. Cinderella is on the brink of leaving her supposedly perfect life behind. She married the man of her dreams. She got the perfect ending because, really, she diligently followed all the rules of fairy tales. Yet now, two children and 13 and a half years later, Things have gone badly wrong, and her life is far from perfect. One night, she's fed up. She sneaks out of the palace to get help from a witch who, for a price, offers potions to disgruntled housewives. But as the old hag flings the last ingredients into the cauldron, Cinderella doesn't ask for a love spell to win her Prince Charming back. Instead, she wants him dead. The charmed wife is endlessly surprising, wildly inventive, and decidedly modern, it weaves together time and place, fantasy and reality, to conjure a world like no other. Nothing is quite what it seems, and the twists and turns of its magical, dark, swiftly shaping path take us into the heart of what makes everything unique, romance, marriage, and the very nature of storytelling. 
And as we round the corner to a happily ever after, we have Fairy Godmothers, Inc., a perfect rom-com with a touch of magic. Ever After, Missouri is a town that runs on magic, and that magic is fueled by love. But the three fairy godmothers who are in charge of Ever After's magic supply realize the town's power has started to wane. So what do they do? They conspire to transform Ever After into a premier wedding destination in the hopes of attracting major infusions of love for the town, of course. Blow a little fairy dust in the direction of two hearts seeking love. What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Fairy Godmothers is filled with quirky charm, sexy romance, witty banter, good old-fashioned laugh-out-loud situations, and thoroughly relatable characters. And it's the first installment of DeWild's new Fairy Godmothers, Inc. series. Don't you already want to visit Ever After over and over again? I do. Thanks to all of your lovely descriptions. There's something so so fun. They're so great. I know. And I love, I just love hearing about fairy tales. I love reading about them. And then, of course, I mean, no surprise on the audio front, but I think it's such a perfect listen, too, because there's just something about someone telling you a story that starts with that idea. Even if it's not the exact words, once upon a time, Mm -hmm. I just feel like there's something about that magical entering of a of a new world that is perfect for for audio or just you know reading out loud or, or hearing you talk about them it's really fun um i don't have a ton of audio news for these yet but the swallowed man will be read by the author which is really cool um and the charmed wife will be read by carissa vacker who is i think a fan favorite for many of the books that she's read over the years um but i just i definitely have like into the woods fairy tale music in my head now thanks to all of your <laughs> lovely <laughs> descriptions <laughs> now i will too <laughs> Um, and now we will turn to the past and look at some new, uh, some special new and forthcoming historical fiction titles. Uh, Jennifer Ryan, the best-selling author of the Chilbury Ladies' Choir and the Spies of Schilling Lane, returns with The Kitchen Front. Two years into World War II, Britain is feeling her losses. The Nazis have won battles, the Blitz has destroyed cities, and U-boats have cut off the supply of food. In an effort to help housewives with food rationing, a BBC radio program called The Kitchen Front is putting on a cooking contest, and the grand prize is a job as the program's first ever female co-host. For four very different women, a young widow, a kitchen maid, a lady of the manor, and a trained chef, winning the contest presents a crucial chance to change their lives. With characters of different social classes and a heated cooking competition, the kitchen front combines all the fan favorite elements of Downton Downton Abbey and the great British Bake Off. It's a bright, brill- vibrant novel that can be recommended to readers who enjoy the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society and the Paris Orphan. That title's a mouthful, no pun intended. (laughs) (laughs) Truly. Uh, Next, we have a story of courage that's set in the Great Plains. The Children's Blizzard by Melanie Benjamin is for readers of Finding Dorothy, Orphan Train, and Before We Were Yours. The morning of January 12, 1888, was unusually mild following a punishing cold spell. It was warm enough for the the homesteaders of the Dakota era to venture out again and for their children to return to school without their heavy coats. However, at just the hour when most prairie schools were letting out for the day, a terrifying fast-moving blizzard blew in without warning. School teachers as young as 16 were suddenly faced with life and death decisions. Do they keep the children inside to risk freezing to death when fuel ran out or send them home praying they wouldn't get lost in the storm? Based on actual oral histories of survivors, this gripping novel follows the stories of sisters Raina and Gerda Olson, both school teachers, one who becomes a hero of the storm and one who is ostracized in the aftermath. It's also the story of Gavin Woodson, a newspaper man seeking redemption after writing embellished news stories that lured northern European immigrants across the sea to settle on a harsh land. 
And at its heart, this is a story of children forced to grow up too soon, tied to the land because of their parents' choices. It's a story of love taking root in the hard prairie ground and of families being torn asunder by a disaster that is little remembered today. The Children's Blizzard is uh, for readers, again, of uh, Finding Dorothy, Orphan Train, and Before We Were Yours. Next, we have Those Who Are Safe by Alexis Landau. As a Russian Jewish emigre to France, Vera's wealth cannot protect her or her four-year-old daughter, Lucy, once the Nazis occupy the country. After receiving notice that all foreigners must report to an internment camp, Vera has just a few hours to make an impossible choice. Does she, does she subject Lucy to the horror conditions of the camp or put her into hiding with her trusted governess, safe until she can retrieve her? Believing that the war will end soon, Vera chooses to leave her daughter in safety. She cannot know that her, she and her husband will have the opportunity to escape, to flee to America. She cannot know that Lucy's governess will have fled with Lucy to, fam to a family in rural France too far to reach in time. And so begins a heartbreaking journey and of separation, war, and a continent apart. Uh, this is a book that touches on themes of motherhood, marriage, love, and war, and it's perfect for book clubs. Um, you should also know that um, Landau's first novel, The Empire of the Senses, was a finalist for the National Book Jewish Book Award. Marty Wingate's Glamour Girls is another World War II tale with a heartwarming heroine that is a spunky, determined English farmer's daughter. And despite her mother's objections, when Rosalie Wright learns that her air transport authority is uh, recruiting a woman's recruiting women's pilots to ferry warplanes across Britain to uh, Royal Air Force bases, um, she decides to join. Uh, and on Gypsy, on the Gypsy Moth aircraft, she delivers um, up to five airfields in a day uh, while fighting an endless battle against skeptical male pilots and ground crews. Rosalie would much rather spend her time on the wing than on the arm of any man, until she meets a pilot, Snug Durand, and a squadron leader, Alan Chersey. Uh, Snug is a wisecracking playboy, and Alan a heartthrob, and Rosalie catches both their attentions. As the war drags on and casualties mount, will love and tragedy send Rosalie's exhilarating airborne life crashing to the ground. Um, the New York Times bestselling author, excuse me, one second. I have lost <laughs> a document. I'm sure everyone's <laughs> writing, scri scribbling anyway, all these great titles. Oh, <laughs> um, the New York Times bestselling author, Reese uh, Bowen offers early praise for this novel, writing, so real it's like reading a personal diary of the brave women who were unsung heroes of World War II. Marty Wingate has managed to get the feel for war, wartime Britain spot on. Well done. Lauren Fox's Send For Me is a sweeping historical family drama that moves between Germany on the eve of World War II and present day Wisconsin. Annalise is a dreamer, imagining her future while working at her parents' bakery in Feldheim, Germany, anticipating all the delicious possibilities yet to come. There are rumors, however, that anti-Jewish sentiment is on the rise, but Annalise and her parents can't quite believe that it will affect them. But as Annalise falls in love, marries, and gives birth to her daughter, the dangers grow closer. A brick thrown through a window, a childhood friend who cuts ties with her, customers refusing to patronize the bakery. Fortunately, Annalise and her husband are given the chance to leave for America, but they must go without her parents whose future and safety are uncertain. Now, two generations later, in a small 
Midwestern town, Annalise's granddaughter, Claire, is a young woman newly in love. But when she stumbles upon a trove of her grandmother's letters from Germany, she sees the history of her family's sacrifices in a new light. Suddenly, she's faced with an impossible choice, the past or her future. Um, there is a personal history behind Send For Me, as the letters within the book were actually written by the author Lauren Fox's own grandmother as she sought uh -huh. escape from Germany. Oh my goodness. Now, oh, this is special. Um, next, we have the sculptress, and this is an absorbing, immersive World War I novel by V.S. Alexander. Uh, May 1917, the elegant streets of Boston are thousands of miles away from the carnage of the Western Front. Yet even here, amid the clatter of horse-drawn carriages and automobiles, it is impossible to ignore the war raging across Europe. Emma Lewis Swan's husband, Tom, has gone to France, eager to do his duty as a surgeon. Emma, a sculptress, has stayed behind, pursuing her art despite being dismissed by male critics. And on the bustling sidewalk, she spies a returned soldier. His brutally scarred face inspires first pity and then something more, a determination to use her skill to make masks for disfigured soldiers. So leaving Boston for France, and Emma crafts intricate, lifelike masks to restore these wounded men to the world. But in the course of her new career, she will encounter one man who compels her to confront the secret she's never real revealed. V.S. Alexander is the acclaimed author of The Traitor, The Irishman's Daughter, the Magdalene Girls and the Taster. And like uh, Alexander's previous novel, The Sculptress is ideal for book, loop, book clubs. And um, he is an ardent student of history with a strong interest in music and the visual arts. His influences include uh, Shirley Jackson, Oscar Wilde, and the Bronte Sisters. Oh, wow, those sound incredible. Um, and I don't have a ton of audio news yet, except for, and this is really wonderful to know, that the children's blizzard is read by the great Cassandra Campbell, who um, is a, a just a fantastic narrator who I think anyone who's an audiobook listener has heard her read something before and uh, very likely some beautiful historical fiction. So she reads The Children's Blizzard. I know somebody asked about if we know who's reading Jennifer Ryan's next audiobook yet, and we do not. Um, but her last one, I know The Spies of Schilling Lane, was read by the fabulous Jane Entwistle. So I highly recommend going back and hearing that one. Or her first one, The Chilbury Ladies Choir, actually had choral music on the recording and multi multiple voices, which is really incredible. Incredible. So um, we know that her audiobooks are always something special, and I hope I have narrator news for this new one soon, which sounds fantastic. Um, I am a big fan of self-help books, so I am very, from everything to how to get a baby to sleep, to how to clean your house, to everything in between, um, and so I'm very happy. you can happy. teach me all of those things, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I absorb it all, I will try and pass it along. But so that makes me very happy today to talk to you about uh, this collection of books from a chorus of voices that can help us find community, um, harness our inner voices, challenge our assumptions, and start something new. Um, first is a book for readers of The Body is Not an Apology and Hunger, and for women looking for a source of empowerment and community. Joy Arlene Renee Cox is the host of the pro-fat, pro-black podcast, Fresh Out of the Cocoon, and her upcoming book, Fat Girls in Black Bodies, is a work combating both fat phobia and racism. She states, to be a woman living in a body at the intersection of fat and black is to be on the margins. There is concern trolling. I just want you to be healthy. And on the other end, outright attacks. And the spaces carved out by third wave feminism and the fat liberation movement fail at true inclusivity and intersectionality. She structured this book into three sections, belonging, resistance, and acceptance. And it is informed by personal history, community stories, and deep research and breaks down the myths, stereotypes, tropes, and outright lies we've been sold about race, body size, belonging, and health. 
And Dr. Cox explores how fat black women can create their own safe spaces and communities instead of tirelessly laboring to educate and push back against dominant groups. Next is a visually stunning work for readers of inspirational self-care books and those who love books that blend poetry and prose and graphic arts. Manjit Thap is a popular young illustrator. She has over 117,000 Instagram followers and her work has been featured in British Vogue, Google, Urban Outfitters, and Apple. And she is the illustrator of the 2018 book, The Little Book of Feminist Saints. Here is Feelings. And Thap offers a stunningly illustrated journey through one young woman's year of emotions. With moods that change as quickly as the weather, the different shades of anxiety and hope that each new season brings, and the stages of joy and pain that fuel our growth. From the spark of possibility and the jolt of creativity in high summer, to the need for release from anxiety and pressure during monsoon, to the desolation and numbness of winter, Thap implores us to consider the seasons of our own emotional journeys. This is a book that allows us to feel connected and comforted by the experiences that make us all human. A necessary reminder for both adults and young adults that emotions have a purpose. And next from the um, from Adam Grant is Think Again. Um, he's the best-selling author of Give and Take and Originals. And here he examines the critical art of rethinking, learning to question your opinions and opening other people's minds. So intelligence is usually seen as the ability to think and learn, but there's another set of cognitive skills that might matter more, the ability to rethink and unlearn. In our daily lives, too many of us favor the comfort of conviction over the discomfort of doubt. We listen to opinions that make us feel good instead of ideas that make us think hard. We see disagreement as a threat to our ego rather than an opportunity to learn. We surround ourselves with people who agree with our conclusions when we should be gravitating toward those who can challenge our thought processes. The result is that we think too much like preachers defending our sacred beliefs, or prosecutors proving the other side wrong, or politicians campaigning for approval, and too little like scientists searching for the truth. Organizational psychologist Adam Grant, who is one of Wharton's top-rated professors, makes it one of his guiding principles to argue like he's right, but listen like he's wrong. With bold ideas and rigorous evidence, he investigates how we can embrace the joy of being wrong, bring nuance to con charged conversations, build schools, workplaces, and communities of lifelong learners. In Think Again, you'll learn how an international debate champion wins his arguments, how a black musician persuades a white supremacist to abandon hate, and how Adam has coaxed Yankee fans to root for the Red Sox. <laughs> Uh, no? <laughs> uh, think again is an invitation to let go of views that are no longer serving us well and prize mental flexibility over foolish consistency. If knowledge is power, then knowing what we don't know is wisdom. Mm. I know, it sounds so good. Right? A lot to think um, about. <laughs> I know. Um, the next is um, if you are a fan of Adam Grant already or of Susan Kame, this next one might be up your mm -hmm. alley. Social Chemistry by Marissa King will utterly transform the way you think about networking. Understanding the contours of your social network, and this is like your actual social network, not your online social network, can dramatically <laughs> enhance your personal relationships, your work life, and even your global impact. Conventional wisdom says it's the size of your network that matters, but King explains that it's the quality and structure of these relationships that has greatest impact on both our professional and personal lives. Are you an expansionist, a broker, or a convener? The answer may matter more than you think. In helping you decode your role, Yale professor Marissa King shows anyone how they can build more meaningful and productive relationships. She includes rich stories of expansionists like Vernon Jordan, brokers like Yo-Yo Ma, and conveners like Anna Wintour, as well as personal experiences from her own world and connections and it all informs this warm, engaging, and revelatory investigation of some of the most consequential decisions we make about the trajectory of our lives. Next is another feel-good book. And if you do not believe the adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, this one might be just for you. 
In Beginners, best -selling, the best-selling author of Traffic and You May Also Like now gives us a thought-provoking, playful journey into the transformative joys that come with starting something new, no matter your age. So why do so many of us stop learning new skills as adults? Are we afraid of being bad at something? Have we forgotten the sheer pleasure of beginning from the ground up? Well, inspired by his young daughter's insatiable need to know how to do almost everything, and stymied by his own mid-career rut, Tom Vanderbilt begins a year of learning purely for the sake of learning. He tackles five main skills and picks a few more up along the way, and he chooses them for their difficulty to master and their distinct lack of career market marketability. He chooses chess, singing, surfing, drawing, and juggling. What he doesn't expect is that the circuitous path he takes while learning these skills will prove even more satisfying than the knowledge he gains. He finds himself having a rapturous experience singing the Spice Girls in an amateur choir, losing, <laughs> games, of ch Isn't that fantastic? losing games of chess to eight-year-olds, and dodging scorpions in a surf camp in Costa Rica. Along the way, he interviews dozens of experts who explore the fascinating psychology and science behind the benefits of becoming an adult beginner. And ultimately, he shares how this refreshed sense of curiosity opens him up to profound happiness and deeper connection with the people around him. It's about how small acts of reinvention at any age can make life seem magical. I love, I mean, this just sounds like such a happy book and it makes me feel so much better about losing chess to my seven-year-old every single time I play. Oh. <laughs> you should be proud. That's really interesting. That he's so good at chess. Uh, or I'm rad bad. So either way, it's perspective. Um, and then finally, um, the last book in this slide, I have a book for fans of mindset, thinking fast and slow, the power of habit, and start with why. In Chatter, Ethan Cross, an award-winning psychologist, reveals the hidden power of our inner voice and shows how we can harness it to live a healthier, more satisfying, and productive life. We all have that voice in our head. When we talk to ourselves, we hope that our inner coach will come out, but sometimes our inner critic does. When you're facing a tough task, our inner coach can buoy us up. Focus, you can do this. But just as often, our critic sinks us entirely. I'm going to fail. They'll all laugh at me. What's the use? In Chatter, Cross explores the silent conversations we have with ourselves. He interviews groundbreaking behavioral and brain research from his own lab and real-world case studies. From a pitcher who forgets how to pitch to a Harvard undergrad negotiating a double life as a spy. That makes my undergrad experience seem really, really easy. Um, <laughs> Cross explains how these conversations shape our lives, work, and relationships. He warns that giving into the negative and disorienting self-talk, what he calls chatter, can tank our health, sink our moods, strain our social connections, and cause us to fold under pressure. But the good news is that we're already equipped with the tools we need to make our inner voices work in our favor. And these tools are hidden in plain sight in the words we use to think about ourselves, the technologies we embrace, the diaries we keep in our drawers, and the conversations we have with loved ones. Chatter gives us the power to change the most important conversation we have every day, the one we have with ourselves. <sighs> That sounds fantastic. These all sound fantastic. Um, and I love, it's so funny, I was just listening to an interview with Chris Rock, and he said how he just learned how to swim, but he's had, like, a pool for, you know, 20 years or something. And I was like, oh, wow. And I love that he admitted that on, you know, national television. I mean, it's it's never too late. But I love all these books. And I think especially for podcast listeners, because you remind me so much of what we enjoy getting out of podcasts. I know someone just um, tweeted that they loved listening to Adam Grant on Armchair Expert, and I think that um, making the audio available of these as well, just to have that format available to people who have really, I think, embraced this, um, you know, self-help. I don't know if it's even a resurgence, but I feel like we talk about it more maybe than we when we used to, but um, these are um, great in all formats. Um, Adam Grant will likely read his audio book, which is fantastic, and um, we expect that Beginners and Chatter will also be author reads. Um, and Social Chemistry is read by the fabulous Brittany Presley. Um, and I'm just excited for all of these. They sound wonderful. So looking ahead, November is Native American Heritage Month. It's a time to celebrate the diverse cultural traditions and uh, acknowledge the important contributions 
of Native people. Um, Heritage Month is also an opportune time to raise general awareness about the unique challenges that Native, Native people across North America have historically and are currently facing, um, and the ways that tribal citizens have worked to conquer these challenges. So here we're sharing um, books that offer varied insights into Native life. Our first title is Dog Flowers. After Danielle Geller's mother dies of a withdrawal from alcohol during a period of homelessness, she is forced to return to Florida. Using her training as a librarian and archivist, Geller collects her mother's documents, diaries, and photographs into a single suitcase and begins on a journey of confronting her family's history and the, the decisions she's been forced to make, a journey that will end at her mother's home, the Navajo Reservation. In this heart-wrenching memoir, Geller master, masterfully intertwines wrenching prose with archival documents to create a deeply moving narrative of loss and inheritance and inheritance that uh, pays homage to the past, to traditions, um, and the family we are given as well as the family that we choose. Um, Gettler has received her MFA in creative writing for nonfiction at the University of Arizona, and she is a recipient of the Rona Jaffe Writers Award in 2016 um, and a 2020 Writing Award finalist. Um, her work has appeared in several publications, including The New Yorker. Next, we have uh, a mine spread out on the ground, and here the personal is a political. Uh, in this urgent and arresting collection of essays, Alicia Elliott asks essential questions about the treatment of Native people in North America, uh, while she draws on the intimate details of her experience with intergenerational trauma offering indispensable insights into the ongoing legacy of colonialism. She engages with a wide range of topics, including love, parenthood, mental illness, poverty, and representation. And in the process, Elliot makes connections between the past and present, um, an evocative meditation on trauma, legacy, and race. Uh, this book is for readers of socio-political analysis and personal essays uh, for fans of Roxane Gay and Samantha Irby. Um, Alicia Elliott, the author, is a Tuscarora writer from Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, she lives in Brantford, Ontario, and she has uh, quickly established herself as an indispensable voice when it comes to Indigenous issues in Canada and has um, strong support from both the Native and non-Native allied community. Next, we have Carrie, a poetic memoir that explores what it means to exist as an indigenous woman in America, told in snapshots of the author's encounters with gun violence. Tony Jensen grew up around guns. As a girl, she learned to shoot birds in rural Iowa with her father, a card-carrying member of the NRA. As an adult, she had guns waved in her face near Standing Rock, and she felt their silent threat on the concealed carry campus where she teaches. And she has always known that in this, she is not alone. As a Metis woman, she is no stranger to the violence enacted on the bodies of Indigenous women on Indigenous land, and on the ways it is hidden, ignored, and forgotten. In Carrie, she maps um, her personal experience onto the historical, um, exploring how history is lived in the body and redefining the language of how we speak about violence in America. Um, she sh shows herself to be a fearless witness to her own difficult history, all the while navigating a violent cultural landscape. And with each chapter, she reminds us that surviving in one's country is not the same as, sur as surviving one's country. 
Little Big Bully, uh, this is a book that you can recommend to readers of Joy Harjo and Leslie Marmon Silco. It's a new collection of poetry, um, and it begins with a question um, asked of, of a collective and troubled we. Um, how did we come to this in an answer to um, this personal myth, um, American and Native American contexts and allegories driven by women's resistance um, to narcissists, stalkers, and harassers. Um, these poems are immediate. They're personal, political, and um, uh, uh, speak to cultural truths. And the, the big sort of existential questions asked is, uh, are, uh, what is the truth now and who are we now? Um, the past for indigenous people um, with the ecosystem near collapse, with the extinction of bison, and the present um, epidemic of missing uh, and murdered indigenous women. Um, these are uh, the themes that underline uh, these poems. Um, the author um, is an, is, has spent her lifetime uh, immersed in the work of her community. Um, she is the author of seven collections of poetry. Uh, she co-founded the Birch Park House with her sister, uh, Louise Erdrich, uh, to support indigenous language uh, re revitalization efforts. Redbone is a graphic novel that tells the riveting story of uh, the Native American civil rights movement through the high-flying career of the West Coast rock and roll pioneers Redbone. Uh, brothers Pat and Lolly Vegas were talented Native American rock musicians that took the 1960s sunset strip by storm. They um, were had a great and tremendous influence on the music industry, and uh, the idea for their band uh, uh, made up for all, uh, made up of all Americans that soon followed. Uh, they do, were determined to control their creative vision and maintain their cultural identity as a band. Uh, they eventually signed a deal with Epic Records in 1969, but as the American Indian movement gained momentum, uh, their band took a stand and chose uh, pride in their ancestry over continued uh, commercial success. Uh, this book is created in co cooperation with the Vegas family, and the authors Christian Stabler, Sonia Pauli Paoloni, and um, the artist Thibaut Balahi uh, take painstaking steps to ensure the historical accuracy of this important overlooked uh, story of America's past. Um, it's part biography and part research journalism um, told through a graphic novel. And uh, finally, Tecumseh and the Prophet. Uh, this is a very insightful dual biography by award-winning historian P Peter Cozens. Uh, here he shows readers that while Tecumseh was a brilliant diplomat and leader admired by the same white Americans he opposed, it was Tenskwatawa, um, called the Shawnee Prophet, who created a vital doctrine of cultural, religious, and cultural revitalization, uh, unifying the disparate tribes of the Old Northwest. Um, Cozen brings us to the forefront of the chaos and violence that characterize the young American Republic. Um, and his previous book, uh, The Earth is Weeping, was a Times History Book of the Year and a Smithsonian Top History Book of 2016. Uh, this is a captivating read that will uh, surely appeal to lovers of history and general leader, readers alike. What an incredible collection. And as you can see on the bottom of the screen, for more ideas of ways to celebrate um, Native American Heritage Month with your community and your library, you can head over to that tiny URL. Um, and just on the audio front, I mean, I think um, with a few of these that are author read, that really allows an amazing opportunity to really hear an authentic voice tell their own story. We expect um, Dog Flowers to be an author read. Carrie is read by the author, Tony Jensen. 
Um, and Tecumseh and the Prophet is read by the fabulous Mark Bramhall, who's um, read many incredible history audiobooks, among many other things, um, but he can do it all. And um, thank you. That's an incredible collection, and we hope that we can help you all celebrate this important Native American Heritage Month. And changing gears a little bit, so um, I wanted to let you know um, about an audio original, which is quite exciting. Um, it's called All Rise from the fabulous Nick Offerman, who's a huge audiobook fan himself. I don't know if you've ever listened to The Greatest Love Story Ever Told with him and his wife, Megan Mullally. They talk about how they like to do puzzles as they listen to audiobooks. Um, but they're huge listeners, and um, as a performer and a humorist and someone who was in the midst of doing um, a stand-up show, when obviously due to um, what's happening in the world, it had to be canceled. Now we're all lucky enough to have a front row seat to be able to hear him do his performance of All Rise. So this is a really special, we're calling it a rollicking evening. Don't you all want Nick Offerman to come to your house and do a private comedy show? Don't we all need that right now? Um, but it's even more than that. I mean, it's 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 it has songs. It has um, a lot of, you know, he, he talks about um, his thoughts about, you know, how we can reach a better side of humanity than the one we've grown accustomed to. I mean, he really does a lot of deep thinking in addition to having a lot of humor and a lot of music. And um, I think there's just really nothing else like this right now. And I think it'll be um, really fun to add to your collections. It was recorded live. And then in addition to that, he did go into the studio just a couple weeks ago to record new introductory material um, himself, which makes it even more timely so he can really comment on, on bringing this audio original into the world. So we hope you don't miss it. It's on sale next week, October 13th. And then um, I have got to round this out. There were so many fun categories, and it's so hard to choose my related kids listening library audiobook titles to go with them. But Elizabeth presented so many amazing updated fairy tales that I thought, okay, if we want to go back to the classics and just remember where the ideas for all these great new um fairy tales sprouted from, this is a great start. And like I said, I think there's nothing better sometimes than being told a fairy tale by a fabulous group of storytellers. So who better than Jim Dale and F. Murray Abraham, perhaps, two award-winning actors to help you remember where the very scary place where many of these stories originated from. So we have Grimm's fairy tales um, and Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. Very dark, surprisingly. This is not for the young, young, young children. <laughs> But um, a great, a great revisiting of fairy tales for all ages and wonderful in audio, read by full cast. Um, for historical fiction, I chose two very magical historical fiction lessons. Maybe the fairy tales put me in the mood for magic, but I hope you don't miss. It's on sale now. The Left-Handed Booksellers of London is from the best-selling master of teen fantasy, Garth Nix. And this takes place in a slightly alternate London of 1983, which um, in some ways I feel like doesn't sound like it should be like that long ago, but I guess it was um, the 80s. Um, but this is a girl's quest to find her father, and this leads her to an extended family of magical fighting booksellers. Don't you want to all think of yourselves as magical fighting booksellers <laughs> who police the mythical old world of England when it intrudes on the modern world? So we all know Garth Nix from his Old Kingdom series, the Seventh Tower series, the Keys to the Kingdom series. Um, so we're really thrilled to have something new from him, and especially in audio, and it's read by the fabulous Marissa Kalin. And then, oh, I love Alan Core Jr. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this narrator. He won the Odyssey Award in in conjunction with Gabrielle Savit for um, Gabrielle's first book, um, Anna and the Swallow Man. So back in 2017, um, Gabriel's debut novel, which was set in Poland during the Second World War, um, won the Odyssey for um, Best Narration that year. And Alan Corduner is back. He's just so wonderful. Just the sound of his voice immediately makes you just want to listen to more. Um, this is a National Book Award finalist. This was announced yesterday. Um, so this is perfect for listeners of Neil Gaiman, P Philip Pullman. It's Sweeping historical fantasy, and in this new um, listen, it follows two teens on a journey through the far country, a Jewish land of spirits and demons. And um, Alan Cordiner, I last saw him in um, My Fair Lady on Broadway, and I got to say hello, and his voice is just 
incredible and you will not be disappointed. Um, and this, especially with all of the magic and the demons and the Eastern European setting. And I think this is just going to be an immersive, really incredible audiobook. Um, and of course, with the awards news yesterday, we couldn't be more excited to remind you to add this to your list. Um, and then self-help, even though these are for kids, I think these could also be for everybody, especially parents um, and, and listeners and readers of all ages. So Super Powered is on sale now. It just went on sale in September, and it's a how-to audiobook from two psychology experts, and it helps kids transform stress and worry and anxiety um, into something that helps them uncover their inner superpowers, which is, I think, such a great way to put it for kids. I think we want to take the shame away from, you know, I think people used to, like, hide self-help books, and now we want you to feel empowered by, by either asking for help or finding ways to cope with all of the madness in the world or in your own personal lives. Um, so this really makes listeners the superheroes of their own stories, and it has a toolkit of really easy-to-understand methods for recognizing recognizing anxious behaviors, and identifying the root causes of what makes us worry. So I think that this is a great way for us all to reclaim our inner superpowers, and it's read by Carissa Becker. And then Peaceful Like a Panda, I did talk about um, – Kira Willie's, what, Kira Wiley's, I hope I'm not saying her name wrong. Um, when I listen to the audiobook again, I'll be reminded <laughs> of her pronunciation, but she released this wonderful collection of three calming activities over the summer. Um, so this is a follow up to that. These are really easy to follow exercises that help you mindfully navigate your day from sunrise to sunset. So it really helps parents get their child through an entire day from, you know, how to wake up, to how to explore the world around you, how to boost your brain before learning, which especially with all of this homeschooling going on could be a really encouraging exercise to engage in um, and how to make the most of your imagination at playtime. So it really has all of these different examples of ways to embrace the day in a peaceful, mindful way. And I think listening to someone who's a proven you know, expert in talking to children. Um, she's the winner of three parents choice gold awards. She's a yoga instructor for kids. She really knows how to talk to her audience. And I think this is a wonderful audiobook to share, especially something we need right now. Um, and this goes on sale December 29th. And then finally, just to add on to the amazing titles Miriam spoke about, um, I didn't want you to miss um, these two audiobooks. So at the Mountain Base, this is from the Coquila imprint um, at Penguin, and the hardcover went on sale last year. So we're thrilled to bring the audio finally to listeners everywhere this December. And also, what's amazing is there's also now a Cherokee edition available on ebook, which could be wonderful to look for for your collections as well. Um, but the audio will likely have authentic Cherokee dance music on the production. And this is about a family who was separated by duty and distance, and they wait for a loved one to return home. Um, it's a lyrical picture book, and I think that kind of language really lends itself to the audio format. And we're so thrilled to bring it to all of you. And then finally, um, Race to the Sun. So if you're not familiar with Rick Riordan's incredible imprint, Rick Riordan Presents, um, which embraces um, all kinds of cultures, and he's really bringing other writers to the forefront to let them tell amazing myths and stories from their own backgrounds and cultures. Um, Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse is read by Kinsali Huiston, and she is a poet from California. She's currently a student at Yale University. And she actually won the Yale Young Native Storytellers Award for Spoken Word and Storytelling. She is so impressive. I highly recommend looking up her website for a, a young person. She's been featured in Time Magazine, the LA Times, Nylon, um, and she does her own personal work exploring contemporary indigenous issues and celebrating her own family history. So she's just such an impressive first-time narrator. And Rebecca was thrilled to have Kinsale read her book. Um, and in a starred review, Kirkus raved that Rowan Horse shows that Native stories are active and alive. Native readers will see themselves as necessary heroes, while readers of all walks will want to be their accomplices. Um, so this is um, an Indigenous fantasy writer's um, adventure about a Navajo girl who discovers that she's a monster slayer. So who wouldn't want to press play on that one? Um, it came out last January, but in case you miss it, missed it. I highely recommend this and all of the Rick Riordan Presents titles um, are amazing, adventurous audiobooks read by authentic, fabulous actors. And that, 
<laughs> that wraps it up. We had so many books to share. We were so thrilled to be back with you. Um, just a reminder, because it's October already, we will be back in November. So stay tuned. Um, when you go to this link, even if you don't see the sign-up link yet, we will make sure we send it around to you, all of you for signing up as soon as it's, as soon as it's available. Um, but in the meantime, you can always head over to that tiny URL to look at the episodes you've missed and to check back and see when our next buzz will be available to sign up for. We hope you'll join us. We'll have lots more to share. And anything else you want to add before we say goodbye for the day? Just thanks for for joining us again. These really are the highlights of of our our um our month. So so we hope you get as much out of them as we do. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's been fun. Thanks for all your interaction with PRH Morning Buzz. We've loved hearing what you're loving or what you loved listening to learning about today that's coming soon. And um, we all hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. We'll Take see you in November. Bye. Bye.